Hey, I'm Ryan. And thanks for checking out our online media library. And I hope this content has been resourcing and equipping you as you journey with Jesus. But I also hope that this isn't the only resourcing and equipping that you're getting in your life. And so if you're not a part of a local church community, I want to invite you to join and go check out a local church community. You know, maybe even come down and check out East Fairview. We'd love to have you. We worship on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And the thing that we talk about most is living with Jesus together so others may know him. That together part is so important for us. So I want to personally invite you to come down and I can't wait to meet you. And I also lastly just want to thank you again for checking out this content. Be sure to like it, share it, subscribe to it. You know, I, I love looking at the little children here uh, at East Fairview and I, I think just, you know, what a wonderful experience it is to grow up in the church. Uh, that wasn't my experience. You know, some of you know a little bit about my story. I didn't grow up in the church, and I uh, really wasn't a Christian until my early 20s. And you know, I was invited to a congregation in Ephrata called the Ephrata Church of the Brethren. I had no idea about the Church of the Brethren. Uh, I just knew that a friend invited me, and um, I uh, fell in love with uh, the pastor there. Uh, and um, that pastor's here this morning. His name's Galen Hackman. Galen was my first pastor. Uh, discipled me for many years and um, it had a profound impact on my life and is really one of the reasons why I'm standing up here this morning as your pastor. And so it's a joy for me to be able to invite him back here to speak this morning to you all. And let me just tell you a little bit about Galen. Um, he's been in ministry for over 50 years, uh, has pastored many churches, has spent quite a bit of time in Nigeria as a professor teaching pastors in Nigeria. So Galen has been all over the world in ministry. He has three children, 12 grandchildren. Uh, he's a little bit of a car enthusiast. I know we have some car enthusiasts out there in the congregation. Uh, he's also a pretty good woodworker. I know we have some guys who do, do a little bit of woodworking here in the congregation. Uh, but most importantly, um, he is a tremendous witness uh, for Christ, and he's a disciple of Christ, and he has discipled many. And so with that said, um, uh, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 5 because that's what he's preaching on this morning. And as has been our custom this year, uh, we read uh, what we're going to be preaching on and talking about this morning. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, if you've been following along. And so we're hopping right back into our series now, going through 1 Corinthians. And for those of you who've been journeying with us, you know that we started 1 Corinthians 1, and we're working our way through this letter, pulling out a practice practical truths and applying them to our lives. And the three truths that we're talking most about, number one, God called you. Number two, God made you rich in Christ. And number three, God will keep you till the end. And so let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. And this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He says, it's actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate because a man is sleeping with his father's wife and you're proud. Now, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? Now, for my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirits. Now, as one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on the one who's been doing this. So when you're assembled and I'm with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Now your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? And so get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Well, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? 
God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ryan, for your gracious introduction, and thanks to your worship team for a sweet time of worship this morning, and thanks to you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, one of the things I do since I left full-time pastoral ministry, which was like eight years ago or so, is uh, coach pastors. So I have the privilege of meeting with Ryan about once a month, um, and i um, work with congregations as a, like an outside, uh, bring an outside perspective. So I often get invited into congregations that are seriously in trouble. They're declining and they're, you know, the pews are barely even full. And if who's there or my age and older, I, I see a lot of that kind of thing because there's a lot of that out there, as you might know. So it's really Exciting to me to speak to a healthy congregation that's got multi-generations in front of me. So just uh, kudos to you. Keep up what you're doing and uh, even more expand upon it. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Ryan didn't mention that my wife, who's with me this morning, is uh, formerly Doris Gingrich, uh, Henry Gingrich's daughter from up this way, and she's had... Uh, relatives in the congregation, aunts and the like over the years, so you can talk to her afterwards, she's over here, if you want to make those connections, some of you who are older and are, remember those days in the congregation. So um, anyway, um, it's good to be with you this morning. So Ryan asked uh, if I could speak uh, sometime this spring, and uh, thanks for this topic, by the way. <laughs> so... Uh, <clears throat> Over the years, I've, I've uh, preached through 1 Corinthians a couple times, um, and um, it's a passage, it's a book that every now and then in pastoral ministry, I'd get a little discouraged with the stuff I had to deal with in the church. Then I'd read 1 Corinthians, and I'd breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> I, I don't have anything like this. Uh, uh, so um, we often turn to 1 Corinthians as kind of a, a, a look into the life of the church, a very human look, kind of, you know, ground level look and to see the struggles that are present there and how um, the, the leadership dealt with that. So actually, I picked a topic. So you can say, duh. Uh, Ryan gave me dates when uh, he wanted somebody else to speak and looking at them, this was the one I was available. <laughs> so I was like, okay, <clears throat> well, it's scripture. Somebody's got to talk about it. And I'm glad to do that this morning. So as I read the passage, the, uh, the phrase that really jumped out to me is, are, and, and you're proud, and you're proud. That, that just really resonated with me. And I think it's a thread throughout this passage. The attitude of the Corinthians toward the situation they faced is a thread through this passage that we have to hold on to. And I'll come back to it as we get to the end. Uh, let's see how this works. There we go. So what was the situation that Paul was facing in the church at Corinth that he writes about in this? Well, he says it very clearly that there's sexual immorality among you. Even the pagans do not tolerate this. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Uh, we assume not his mother, a, a stepmother of some uh, kind, but uh, nevertheless a situation that uh, was certainly not tolerable. Uh, uh, this word pagans, we hang up, get hung up on it sometimes. It sounds really cruel, you know, what, he was a part of a motorcycle gang? You know, who, who was this, this guy that he was a pagan? Uh, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, that's not quite what pagan means, biblically speaking. A pagan was simply a person who did not worship the one true God. That is, not a Jew, not a Christian. Uh, they did not have an understanding of the one true God. They uh, had some other religious system, if they had one at all, that's, that's uh, pagan. Uh, worship of idols, like was prevalent in the Greek world and the Roman world, a uh, plethora of gods that you worshipped uh, in the pantheon of the gods of their time. That, that's pagan worship as we understand it. And as I said, father's wife, presumably like a stepmother, doesn't make it any better. Uh, and when, when uh, <clears throat> you know, he says that, uh, that 
not, you know, not even the, uh, the uh, pagans would accept such practice. That's saying something because pagan morality was really loose. Um, all kinds of sexual, what we would consider sexual immorality was acceptable in the pagan world. Uh, so you got to ask, like, you know, Paul says, and the problem is, the problem is not so much that this is happening in the church. After all, the church is filled with people. People are humans. We have struggles. We have issues. Any of you have never sinned? You know, Ryan might remember this from my pastoral ministry, but sometimes I would say to people who were applying for baptism, don't assume that this is going to mean you will never sin again. Actually, the only way I can guarantee that you will never sin again is if I hold you down until the bubbles stop. <laughs> no one took me up on that in all my years of ministry. So here we are, we've got issues, we struggle with temptations. So the issue was not so much that there was sin in the church. The issue was that you were proud about it. Can you imagine that? They were, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't you be mourning over the fact that this is uh, happening among you? So this attitude of pride, I asked, you know, what were they thinking? What were they thinking? That they would be boastful about this. Later on, Paul uses the word boastful, verse 6. You're boasting. It's not good. Of course not. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a little hard to get into what was the culture of the church at Corinth. Uh, all we have are Paul's letters, First and Second Corinthians, hints at some other correspondence that Paul had with them. But when you read the book carefully, actually Gordon Fee, one of one of our one of our leading New Testament scholars of this past generation, he's uh, is he still alive? but I know he had dementia, but anyway, great scholar. He says that the Corinthians had experienced a, a real movement of the Holy Spirit. They had been awakened to a significant degree. They were experiencing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were Pentecostal. <laughs> they, they, they had, they, later on, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, you're going to get into this situation of, of the gifts that were present. And they were experiencing life in Christ to such a degree that, you know, they were, they were spiritually focused. And Fee says, now this is theological language, Fee says they had an over-realized eschatology. In other words, they, my, here's how my mother would say it. She had no idea she was bumping into the same thing. Uh, she uh, occasionally, someone would set up a, a, a tent in, in the cornfield somewhere in the area, and somebody would come in, and there would be a, a holy roller meeting, you know? Uh, this, and, and she would say, you know, they're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. That was my mother's phrase. But so the Corinthians got so wrapped up in, in, in the spiritual world that they began to say, this is perspective, they began to say, what we do physically doesn't really matter. We have left the physical behind, and now we are so spiritual that we can live above this plane of physical things. Now, if that's the case, they're proud because, hey, look where we have arrived. We're so spiritual. We can exercise the desires of the flesh, and it doesn't affect us. Paul's like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not biblical Christianity. Now, maybe that's what's going on with the Corinthians. Maybe they were just arrogant enough to say, you know, isn't it nice how libertine we are? How broad our embrace is? I bump into churches like that sometimes today. Look how broad our embrace is. We just embrace everything. And maybe that was their theology. I don't know. Either way, it's not good, Paul says. So their thinking was warped. Uh, no question about that. Now, there are things we don't know about the situation, and I want to just name a few of these first off, because sometimes we forget to step back and say, now, wait a minute, uh, before we jump into the pool at the deep end, we need to recognize what we don't know about this situation. So we don't know how long this situation was going on. In other words, we meet it at a critical moment in the life of these people who were who were engaged in this activity, as well as in the life of the church. We don't know how long it's been going on. We don't know how many attempts were made in the past to deal with the situation, how many 
conversations, how many counseling sessions, so to speak, how many interactions. We, we don't know. Uh, we just see this particular moment in the life of the situation. Uh, we don't even know specifically who's involved. Uh, a man and his father's wife. I, I kind of presume that because the focus is on the man and not the woman, the woman may not have even been in the church, may, may not have been a part of the community. They, you know, there's no conversation about what do we do with the other half of this equation. Um, and we also don't know exactly what is meant by some of Paul's words in his recommendation. What precisely did he have in mind? Uh, and we also don't know what the outcome was. Now, there is a passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul argues for the reinstatement of, it, of an offender back into the life of the church. Some people make the connection, oh, that's this guy. Maybe it is. We don't know for sure. Uh, actually, I think it's Fee who says it was not him. I don't know how, it was, how he knows it was not him. We just don't know exactly what the outcome was. Uh, we can hope that the action resulted in reconciliation and restoration, but we don't we don't know. So what, what is clear? What is clear? Well, here's some things that are clear. The conduct was unacceptable, inappropriate. You say, well, duh. Of course it was. But that's, that's making a statement that in its current conduct had to be made and, 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 and had to be made clear. This is not appropriate conduct. It was forbidden in the Old Testament under Levitical law, that is, to have a sexual relationship with your mother and your stepmother that was um, forbidden, specifically forbidden. And as I said, even in pagan culture, it was not acceptable, which, as I said, was, is saying something. Um, my wife and I had the opportunity to tour Pompeii a number of years ago, and uh, <clears throat> as our guide was taking us through Pompeii, you know, amazing uh, preservation of a first century Roman Greek town. Uh, preserved up to the first floor. So it's all, all the ash has been scooped out from the volcano that blew, blew um, Vesuvius, and you can tour the houses, walk the streets. It's, it's just really amazing. Um, so we're in this first century home and uh, looking at the different rooms, and our guide takes us into this room where on the wall are frescoes, that is like uh, paintings, frescoes, of an erotic nature. It was x-rated, x-rated room. In the corner is a stone phallus. And so the guide says, oh, I see my American tourists are quite embarrassed. That's what he said. <laughs> uh, we were maybe the only Americans in the group, I don't know. But he goes on to say, uh, this was first century, normal first century life. While uh, the man's wife is in the kitchen making dinner, he is in this room with his prostitutes, concubines, lovers, small boys, whatever his preference is, and it's okay. Now, if that's the culture of first century, uh, the first century world in, 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 in Corinth there, to say that even pagans don't allow this, that's saying something, right? Um, so anyway, I just point that out to say that, uh, you know, this was the world in which Paul lived and had to deal. It's no wonder that in all of Paul's letters and others like Peter, uh, for example, there is repeated teaching about what is morally correct uh, from, the, from the perspective of God and God's heart. Why is that? Well, it was a problem, friends. It was a problem everywhere the gospel went. Um, so we think sometimes today our society is getting really loose. Yeah, but we've got a ways to go until we're as loose as that. And so the regular teaching of what is acceptable morality within the Christian faith was important back then as it is today. So we know that, okay? Uh, we also know that the situation had reached a point where a decisive action was needed. Uh, like I said, um, 
We don't know how long this has been going. We don't know what process had been used. We don't know how many steps of reconciliation were taken. We can assume that there were more than these. But now we're at a point where something has to be done because there's been an impact upon the church at large. And I asked, well, what was that action? And here's where Paul says some things that were like, huh? He says, well, I want you to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. That's verse 5. Then at the very end of the passage, and I should say I'm not dealing with there's some things in this passage that, that I'm, not, I'm not having time to, to touch on. But at the very end of the passage, he says, Expel the wicked person from among you. Verse, uh, that last verse, verse uh, 13. So it's pretty clear what Paul wants is this man to be removed from the church. What do we call that? Excommunication. That's what he's calling for. Now, this is a, a serious, decisive action that he's asking for. But what does that mean, and what does it look like? And so these, this, uh, I find these phrases interesting. So, for example, hand this man over to Satan. Wow, that sounds, that sounds harsh. It sounds cruel. It sounds even a little barbaric, maybe. What do you mean, hand this man over to Satan? We need to pause there and just think a bit about um, first century life, you understand that in the entire city of Corinth, about 90 to 100,000 people, which would be the size of Mannheim Township and Lancaster City combined, in, 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 in that number of people, how many Christian churches were there at this time? One. This one. Now, it may have, there may have been house groups meeting in different places, but there was one church. That's it for these 100,000 people, and it was understood that there are, there are two basic domains in the world. There is the kingdom of heaven, the domain of God, and there is the kingdom of this world, the domain of Satan. He is the God of this world, the scriptures say. Um, not the God that is sovereign over the world, no, that's the God of heaven, but the God that's been allowed to kind of control the environment that's outside of the kingdom of heaven. Where is the kingdom of heaven expressed? It's expressed in the church. The church was seen as an ark of safety. Actually, the image, the, uh, the Old Testament story of the ark and how the people are saved from it became a metaphor in New Testament times for the church. This is a place of safety. We come together under the grace of God and the protection of his Holy Spirit as we worship together as a community. And so to say, to take this man and, and turn him over to Satan is to say, remove him from the safe environment of the church and place him back in the world at the disposal of Satan. Let Satan do his work. Woo! Now, that, so that, that's the thinking. Uh, today, we don't, you know, we don't see it quite like that. Um, for starters, if, you know, how many churches are there in Manhattan Township in Lancaster City? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, in, when I was pastor in Ephrata, there were 50 churches that had an Ephrata address. 50. Now, some of them were... RDs, you know, they were rural, they were, they were, they were outside of the city of Ephrata, but uh, so our world is different today, but this was the thinking at the time, uh, this place of safety versus this place of danger. And so we do this, what for? Well, for the destruction of the flesh. Oh, flesh, what does that mean? Body? We want this guy dead? No, no. The Greek word for flesh, sarks carries a, a variety of meanings in the New Testament, and it often means sinful nature, sinful desires, sinful actions. So when I talk about my flesh is weak, I, I, may, be, I may be bench pressing, pressing a thousand pounds. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, I don't. But I may be bench pressing and still say my flesh is weak, meaning... You know, my nature, my, my inner desires, I, I'm weak, I, I give in to temptation quickly, and that's flesh. 
biblically speaking. So I think what Paul is saying is that we step back from this person and the cover of protection that the church offers that person, and we, we, we place them back out there in the world and let them experience the fullness of their choices so that eventually they may wake up and say, wow, I, I need to choose differently. Uh, I see the, the destruction of this lifestyle, this choice that I'm making. And so Paul's desire is that this individual would experience some kind of an awakening that would result in the destruction of his sinful nature. That is the, the, the choice, the desires to make the choices that he is in respect to this uh, inappropriate conduct. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> he says, you can see that here, so that his spirit is saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's goal, Paul's goal is not punishment. So we need to see that clearly. His language is harsh. It is decisive. It is direct. It is time to take action. And it could be read as being punitive. That's not his purpose. His purpose is remedial. His purpose is, res is restoration. It is redemption. His purpose is to bring about the salvation of this individual in the long run. Uh, if you're a parent, you, you know the difference between punitive and remedial punishment. Hopefully, we don't discipline our children to punish them. We discipline them so that they might be restored. Though discipline can at times feel like punishment when you're on the receiving end. <laughs> I've been there uh, a few times. Um, and we need to understand that Paul's motive is not punitive, it is redemptive. He wants this person to come back to the Lord and be restored to this place of righteousness in his kingdom. I just want you to see that. Um, we also understand, it's clear to us from the passage, that this person's, well, this, this was, the situation was affecting the church. And so this, this uh, analogy of the yeast, when it starts in verse 6, you know, your boasting's not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens a whole bunch, a whole batch of dough? Yeast in Scripture is a biblical metaphor for influence, whether good or bad. Some scriptures, the yeast is a, is a metaphor of good influence, like in the, king, ye, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast hidden in a dough, that it will, it, it will affect the whole lump of dough. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes yeast is used uh, in a negative sense. In this case, it's a bad use. Uh, don't, don't you understand that this, this situation is affecting the entire church? There's an effect upon the whole lump of dough, as it were, because of this situation. And so, you know, I ask, well, what is this yeast that Paul's talking about? And, and, and normally our mind goes, first of all, to the action of this, the immorality of this man and his, uh, his, his uh, stepmom uh, and what they're doing. And, of course, that action, the sin, the sinful actions of the man in question are part of the yeast. But I also think, and as I worked in this passage this week, I, it really became clear to me that I believe Paul also felt that the attitude of the Corinthians in their proud, boasting attitude toward, was part of the problem as well. That was part of the yeast that was affecting the health of the congregation. You hear what I'm saying? So yeah, it's the sin, but the sin isn't just the action. The sin is your, how you view the action and your willingness to embrace it and ignore it, as the case may be. Um, so the real, the, real, the real point here, I think, is that there was a negative impact uh, of the actions and the attitudes on the spiritual culture of the congregation. Now, that's something that I don't have time to explore in much depth today, but something to think about. How, does, how do your actions as a member of this congregation and your attitudes affect the overall spiritual health of the congregation. Friends, there's a direct connection. There's a direct connection. Um, 
There's reasons some congregations are struggling and weak and faltering in their following of the Lord and why other congregations are experiencing some strength and vitality there. And it doesn't all have to do with how great the preacher is or how effective the programs of the church are. There's something much deeper at play. It's the spiritual climate and culture of the congregation which is directly impacted by the people of the church. Their actions, yes, but we're all sinners. I don't mean to excuse that. But part of our sin is our attitude towards sin and towards one another, especially towards those caught in sin. Uh, so something to meditate on and think about that comes to us from this particular passage. I didn't look what time I started. So you gave me a whole chapter. Come on. <laughs> so anyway, um, so how does this apply to the church today? That's a really good question. You know, in our heritage, the brethren, the Mennonites, the Anabaptists, uh, we took passages like this seriously. And, you know, so we, you know, we, we, we tried to practice uh, some level of excommunication. And even, I'm not going to deal with this at all, but this last section, the last uh, two verses, uh, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church are uh, no, wait, I, I need to go up for all, further. Uh, verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 11, when he says, uh, talks about people that are caught in sin, do not even eat with such people. So, even today, the Mennonite church, or the, the, the Amish church, practices what they call the ban. So, when a member of the church is cast out, uh, you're not even allowed to sit down at a table and eat with that person. So they take this very literally. I'm not suggesting we do that. I'm just saying, in our history, we took this seriously. We wrestled with, what does this mean, you know, for us? And I think sometimes we made some bad choices in respect to how we practice this, but at least there was a seriousness there about trying to practice uh, this. Um, so what does it mean for the church today? And that, this is, um, I don't mean to answer the question for you <laughs> as a congregation, but uh, first of all, <clears throat> it means we need to check our attitude towards sin and towards one another. That's the first thing it means. You know, we live in a world that is pressuring us to become very libertine. You know, to just about allow almost anything. Well, not everything yet, but every year it seems to be something else that we should be uh, agreeing to by way of morality within our world. Um, and so um, we need to check our attitude towards sin, but we need to check our attitude towards one another as well, particularly uh, uh, towards those who are struggling in sin, which is all of us to some degree or another. Some sin is just more visible, more damaging. You know, how do we walk together as brothers and sisters in Christ, truly wanting to help each other and acknowledging that we too are sinners? Remember, the guy who wrote this, who said, I've already decided what to do. I've made my judgment. This guy needs to be kicked out of the church. He, this, the guy who wrote this, Paul, is the same guy who said, I am the worst of sinners. I am the worst of sinners. So we need to check our attitude towards sin and towards one another uh, as we walk together. Um, we also, there we go. Uh, we need to consider all the passages related to helping sisters and brothers who are struggling with sin. In other words, the Bible speaks to this occasionally, and I just put a few up here, like Matthew 15, uh, 18, sorry, Matthew 18, uh, a passage that's been really important in, the, in our life as a people, a congregation in this Anabaptist community. It's the one that says, if you see your brother sin, if you see your sister sin, if you see a fellow believer sin, what do you do? You go to the person and you talk with them, right? If it's a sin against you, maybe you can be reconciled, whatever, you know, but, but you start at this level of reaching out conversation. That doesn't work, you take somebody with you. So, you know, we need to start there and realizing that so much can be resolved if we sit down and have a conversation with the person instead of go around talking about the person. You know what I mean? 
So we need to start at Matthew 7. Um, don't, um, uh, don't judge others uh, who have a speck in their eye when you've got a plank in your own eye. In other words, now that passage goes on to say, that's not a passage against using judgment and discernment in our relationships. It's a passage that warns us when you do this, you need to do it consistently, not, hypocr- not with hypocrisy. So in other words, it, it, if I'm holding this brother that Paul's talking about to a place of accountability in respect to his sexual conduct, I need to hold myself to the same standard. And if I don't, I'm a hypocrite and I have no right in trying to, you know, reconcile this situation. So Matthew 7 is all about you got a plank in your own eye. You got, you got to be willing to deal with the plank if you want to help somebody that's got a speck. You know what I mean? And Galatians 6, you who are spiritual, when you, if you see a brother or sister caught in sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in meekness, and meekness, that is, you know, with, a, with an attitude of, of love and graciousness and, and, and being careful in meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So this is work for people who are walking with the Lord in a spiritual sense, who have a sensitivity to personal interreaction, inter you know relationships, and also who are sensitive to the fact that we we have to be also open to receive correction in our own lives. So all I'm saying is, <clears throat> if there's a situation you think has to be dealt with, look at all the scripture, right? Make sure that you're walking in truth with all of these biblical encouragements as you work with one another in the congregation, checking your attitude towards sin and one another. And be patient, loving, kind, always focus on forgiveness and restoration. The purpose of discipline is always redemption, always restoration, whether it's children or adults or... Man, if if only our criminal justice system could see this. You know, right now we're about punishing criminals, not restoring them. Anyway, uh, and uh, make decisions of this nature in community. You notice how Paul says, I've decided what to do, but when you come together as a people, you need to work at this. So this kind of work is done in community, not one person you know, holding uh, the, the, you know, the, the stick, as it were. And place yourselves in direct proximity to the people outside the church who need Christ. Paul, this last section, Paul is like, you guys completely misunderstood me. I didn't say you should remove yourself from the world. No, you need to live in the world. You need to rub shoulders with the sinners. You need to have relationships with them so that they might be led to Christ. But then we in the church need to walk by a different standard. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard as we are interacting with the world. Otherwise, you look in from the outside, and this has been said a number of times, I think, uh, uh, who's the research guy on the West Coast? Um, um, pardon? No, no, the guy does all the statistical research. Uh, I can't think of it right now. Um, yeah, anyway, so often he comes out and he says, you know, the problem is that uh, the, the, the choices by which Christians are living are no different than the choices by which the people in the world are living. And if that's true, we have a problem. We are not this place of safety, offering another way of living, you know? Um, So how does this apply today? Well, these are things that we need to take into consideration while we attempt to take sin seriously in our own lives and in the life of our congregation. So I ask myself, what, what would this passage sound like if the Corinthian church had taken this situation seriously from the start? If he hadn't left it, go to this degree. I don't know the answer to that. It's just something to think about. Uh, And also to remind you that the issue is not, is there sin in the church? Of course there is. That's really not the question. That's really not the issue. We are human. We struggle. The challenge is this, comes from this, and and you are proud. The issue is, what is my attitude? What is your attitude towards sin? Whether it's in my own life or that of another. 
Do we really care? Are we willing to bring ourselves under the mantle of biblical truth and surrender to the Lord and in humility confess our needs and our struggles and then embrace those who do that alongside of us? Um, that's the real struggle. Are you proud, <laughs> boastful, arrogant, or humble, mournful at the state of our world and so often our church? And I leave that with you as the challenge for you from this passage of Scripture here this morning. So let's pray. God, thank you for 1 Corinthians, the letter. Thank you for the church at Corinth. Thank you for Paul and his wise counsel. Um, we thank you, Lord, that as we read this book, we might say, wow, we're, we, don't, we don't have those problems. And, and we thank you for the grace that has persevered among us and uh, has brought a sense of cleansing to our lives and to the life of this congregation. But on the other hand, we are quick to say we are not perfect and we fall short in many ways. And it's not the fact that we sin that's the issue. The fact is, what's our attitude towards that? So we pray for repentance where necessary, for grace where necessary, for uh, truth and honesty to prevail among us. And I thank you for this congregation and ask your blessing upon its ministry as it journeys on into the future. Uh, and I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>